And any kids going to kid worship are certainly welcome at the, at the back door. That doesn't sound really right. If you enjoy me in praying, please. Heavenly Father, we, we recognize that, Lord, you are in this place. This is your house. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would, would fill us, that truly we would have uh, new eyes to, to see and ears to hear, that your word would take a root in our heart, Lord, that we would be listeners and doers, and above all, even more transformed into the uh, image of your son, Jesus. And Lord, it's in, in his name that I pray this and pray that you would uh, use my words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the figuration. As with first service, I feel compelled to uh, ad- admit to you at the, at the outset that I find the transfiguration narrative a little bit puzzling. You see, not, it's not the sort of like faith roadblock puzzling, but more along the lines of like the highway rumble strip, strip puzzling. You know, it doesn't impede you as you go along, but it kind of can sometimes be a little bit jarring. Because for me, every time I keep reading it, I've got so many questions that keep flooding my head as I'm reading the text. I keep thinking, what's this whole bit about tents? I'm not really following what's going on here. And how come nobody's freaked out that all of a sudden dead people are back and talking and nobody's saying anything about that? (laughs) So I kept thinking about this over and over again. And what I started to realize is as I'm pursuing answers, these questions are actually serving more of a, as a distraction to me than really moving me forward. You see, because I'm reminded that in its purpose, the Bible is more about our transformation and interest in that than in providing us information. You know, a lot of times at the, at the first service liturgy, we, we sing from, from John, and it says, these things are written so that you may believe. It doesn't say that you may know or that you may be informed, but these things are written so that you may believe. The Bible says what our issue is, is we need transformation, not purely information. Yet you and I spend every day in a world that says, no, we'll be transformed by the amount of information we get. We need more information, says our world. If only we knew more, we'd live healthier lives. If only we knew more, our lives wouldn't be a mess. If only we knew more, we behave kindly towards one another. You wouldn't see the fractures in our society. And yet you have to stop and think, in a world drowning with information at our fingertips, we're really absolutely no different than the people in Moses' time. The people who grumbled, the people who were easily distracted, the people who went and said, I think I'll do what's right in my own eyes, the people whose hearts were more upon themselves than upon others, the people whose, whose hearts would only give God time on Sunday morning or when we really need Him, the rest of the time not really interested in hearing what He has to say. So as I started realizing that, I came back again to those rumble strips and I was thinking about them and I said, what's really the purpose of the rumble strips on the highway? They let you know when you've kind of deviated from the main point. Now, that's not an admonition to say, there's never ask questions about things, but it's to say we need to put the primary things first in the right, and then in the right order. So it stops me, and then I go back to the text, and I say, Lord, as I'm, as, as I'm going to read this, what is it that you want me to, to, to see here? What is it you want all of us to see? And what's going on in this mountaintop, Lord, that you want to transform our lives with? As you read the narrative, The central piece is, of course, the transfiguration, which is kind of an odd word because we don't really go around saying that each and every day. In fact, we're more familiar with the idea of metamorphosis, which is an okay thing to use because that's what it is, the transformation of one thing into another. I mean, grade schoolers everywhere grow up on this, right? The metamorphosis of a caterpillar into a butterfly. It doesn't change. It's no different. That's what it was all along. 
you see and you look in Jesus and you say, what was his end state here on the mountaintop? He transfigured and transformed into light. White light. The whitest of all lights. Bleached more than anybody could. And you and I look at that and we say, okay, I guess that's a pretty good thing. Transformed into light. But you have to admit, none of us is truly really excited about that. In fact, if I came to any of you and said, you can transform into something, already I know your minds are going much faster. Somebody has set off Miss Prime already. You think of anybody's kids, my kids especially, I've heard them playing. They imagine a lot of things. I've not once heard them say, and now I am light. It's just not something we think about. You know, but perhaps if we made it the, our habit to hide God's word in our heart, and we took the Old Testament truly as, as God's beloved word, you'd see the greatness of what the passage was this morning from, from Exodus. What do we see with Moses? He meets with God, and he comes down, and his face is shining with light. This is the light reflected just from being with God comes off him. And it's so strong that the people are terrified. And they haven't put a veil over his face. But what's, but what's the difference here with Jesus? With Moses, he's more like the moon, reflects the light of the sun. It's not the source of the light. And when you look at Jesus here, the light comes from where? From within him. So all throughout this, these past couple of weeks, we've been talking about epiphanies, those things that God reveals that otherwise we wouldn't know. And you see here our, the, the first epiphany in the, in the text. That Jesus, though he looked like everybody else, in this transfiguration, this metamorphosis, you see that the light comes from within him, that he is actually God himself. So we can certainly stop at this point and uh, everybody get home, get home early. But even in the short passage, what you see is there's so much more still left over. Whenever you're reading the text, you see repeated words and you have to stop here and ask yourself, why are there words repeated here? And Matthew writes and he says the word behold twice. And it's Matthew's way of, of taking us and saying, see this, I want you to see what's here. And so you ask, yourself, behold, what, what are the two beholds? He says, behold, Moses and Elijah. Behold, the voice in the cloud. So behold, Moses and Elijah. Why, the, why these two? Matthew tells us earlier in his gospel in chapter 11, when after John the Baptist has been imprisoned, he turns and he tells the people, he says that until John came, the law and the prophets always pointed forward to the Messiah. And so here, Moses and Elijah, they stand in for the, law, for the law and the prophets. He said, Matthew says, Moses and Elijah are sitting here, they're, they're talking. But he doesn't say what they're talking about. And it's actually Luke's gospel that you have to turn to. Because Luke includes in there, he says they're talking about his deliverance. And for once when we're reading the text, if you just take the Greek words, it makes more sense than the English because it says they were talking about his exodus. And so for us as Christians on this side of the cross, that's something that rings a lot differently. We say, I remember the Exodus, how God delivered his people from Egypt. We know that Jesus is going to the cross. And so here you're left with epiphany number two, which is that it's Jesus himself who will be the one to lead this greater than any Exodus. Epiphany number three, behold, the, the voice in the cloud. It's God speaking. And it's more direct here. It just says, this is my beloved son. And so you put all these three epiphanies together and you have Jesus, the one to lead this exodus to come. Jesus, the one who is the source of light, who is God himself. And Jesus was in some way still God's son. But the big question is, 
really, what difference does this make in our lives? I mean, you and I, we, we, we sit here and we, we nod and we say, okay, I, I, hear, the, I hear these epiphanies and many of us have, have heard them many times before, so it's, it's, not, it's not new. So we say, isn't this really just more information? And yet I thought you said the Bible cares about transformation. I'd like you to take a moment as we, as we read uh, verse 6 again. Take a, take a moment to really to probe your heart as you, as you hear these words, and imagine yourself up on the mountaintop. God has just spoken from the cloud, and we read, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. You know, deep down, we all know that our place is really on the ground with the disciples when the voice of God speaks. We know that none of our lives reflect the light of God the way Moses' face did. We know that rather instead of, instead of light, we're probably more familiar with what John 3.19 says, which is that passage after John 3.16, for God's love of the world, the part that we don't read, where it says that instead the people, they love darkness more than light. It's a hard place to be in, and we say, what can be done? The voice of God said from the cloud, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. We read in our epistle passages this morning, Peter's testimony. He said, I was an eyewitness to these things. We heard the voice. We saw. And so you and I look and say, well, if, if the command is to, is to obey his voice, Peter's got it easier. He was up there. You and I, we weren't on the mountaintop. So the question is, where, where do we go to hear Jesus' voice? How do, how do we obey with that? It's in God's word. It's the only place that Jesus promises that he'll speak to us. Jesus himself confirmed this on the Emmaus Road when he talked with, with those who were walking. He opened up the scriptures, which by the definition at the time would have been the Old Testament, and he pointed out everything that pointed forward to him and said, all of these testified to me. Listen to him. You read in God's word, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, you and I don't go a day of not even considering what our next meal is going to be, where it's like. We provide for ourselves each and every day with what God gives us. And some of us certainly show the stomachs to, uh, to attest to that. But how many of us realize that we have really spiritual starvation when we don't feast on God's word each and every day. I mean, really like get into it, to gnaw on it, to savor it, to look around, to read around, to see who is God? What are the things that he's done? What is the salvation that he's brought about? To remind ourselves of it, to see who we are as people. And yes, quite often we do come exactly as the disciples do, down on, down on our faces. But it's at that point when you're there, you then read those next words that Jesus said on the mountaintop when he says, and he puts out and he touched them and he said, rise, have no fear. But we stop and we think, how can Jesus say this? If we are ones who know more darkness and don't reflect the light, how can Jesus say rise and have no fear? That's where we have the epiphanies that come back in because we remember that it is Jesus who is the light, he's God himself and yet his son to lead this greater exodus for us that we know that he's going to go from the mountaintop to come down to the cross to bear the sin of my darkness, of your darkness, of all those who would believe so that he can declare it is finished. Rise. Have no fear. 
the last words of the passage for today are, and then the disciples lifted up their eyes and they saw no one but Jesus only. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, would you make it true of our lives that in all our comings and goings, we would see nobody but your son, Jesus. Lord, help us to, to feed ourselves. Give us that hunger. Help us to be aware of it. That, Lord, we would just want to sit with you in your word, hear from you, know who you are. Lord, we do desperately want to taste and see that you are good and you indeed are. Bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.